and welcome to Landscape Photography World, the podcast for everyone passionate about landscape photography. I'm Grant Swinburne, and I'll be your host on this show, talking to landscape photographers about their motivations, likes and dislikes. I'm very excited to announce that the inaugural Landscape Photography World Awards launches today. Early bird entry is available now at a discounted fee until September 30, 2022. Head to landscapephotographyworldawards.com to find out all the details and how to enter. There's some amazing prizes to be won, and I'll be publishing a book and a calendar with the top images from the competition, so plenty to look forward to. Entries close on November 30th, 2022, so there's plenty of time to get your entries sorted. Anyway, on with the show. This time I'll be talking to Joel Fitzgibbon about his amazing landscape and motorsport photography. Joel is a photographer from the central coast of New South Wales and his journey started slightly differently to some other photographers. Buying a drone before he'd bought his first camera. Being attuned to the fast pace of motorsport, he also found an interest in landscape photography that he used to improve his craft and develop the skills he hadn't explored before. We talk about his photography history, how shifting between motorsport and landscape photography has helped him develop his style, and how he's dealing with becoming less interested in landscapes. I hope you enjoy the show. Hey, Joel. Welcome to Landscape Photography World. How are you going? Yeah, not too bad. Thanks for having us. Yeah, that's an absolute pleasure, mate. Um, I know you and I have met uh, a couple of times on shoots and whatever, but, uh, you know, I... A lot of people probably don't know who you are, so why don't you tell them who you are and uh, what, what what you're doing on my podcast? <laughs> well, uh, firstly, thanks for the invite. Um, glad to join you. You know, explain or well, sort of discuss my story and photography related story. Um, so, for those that don't know, uh, my name is Joel Fitzgibbon. I go by the alias of Fitzy Images. I am a landscape and motorsports photographer slash videographer, and I am 24 from the Central Coast. That's pretty. That's pretty well sums up my personal story. <laughs> so, how how did you get started in photography at all? Funnily enough, I actually started years ago through motorsports. So, I used to race motocross competitively, mm-hmm. and I used to go to some of the higher level state and national events, um, and used to do a little bit of photography on the side just for you know a couple of me mates that were riding, and. Um, yeah, that, that's pretty well where it all kicked off from. And then a couple of years ago, I always had an interest in drones and drone technology and um, got a drone and, yeah, fell in love with it and I was hooked and then progressed up buying better gear and found out how expensive a, of a uh, hobby it was. But <laughs> um, It's definitely a, 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 an expensive addiction, I find. Oh, yeah. I don't know what's uh, more expensive, motorsports or photography. <laughs> Uh, I reckon it's pretty close. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. So we were talking a little bit earlier and you said you've sort of uh, started to drift away a little bit from some of the yep. landscape stuff. Um, why don't you tell me about that and, uh, you know, what, what what's going on in, you know, that motivation that may or may not be there for, for landscapes um, so, and why uh, the motivation might be stronger elsewhere. So what I find um, is the biggest driving factor is uh, lately just haven't really had any motivation to, to shoot. I'm a very creative sort of person. Like I like to challenge myself to, you know, essentially walk into a situation, not knowing what I'll be able to do, you know, sink or swim. So I've pretty well shot nearly every spot on the coast, you know, Newcastle down the central coast. And I, I'm not a person that can do the rinse and repeat as such. Mm -hmm. I like to, again, like I, I like to challenge myself and see what I can create. Um, and I find that with landscape, it's um, just in the local area, it hasn't really been intriguing or challenging enough for me to want to shoot. So that's kind of um, the reasoning behind why I've sort of started putting more of a heavy emphasis on the motorsport side of thing, um, which, yeah, it's, it's, a lot like for some people that haven't done it before, it's it may sound easy, but it's it's far from it. <laughs> um, I find one of the biggest challenges is getting that shot because the conditions. So this is an old expression for, or so an old saying from uh, the motocross days. So generally, we have about forty riders on the gate. Yeah. Um, so the 
the saying goes, there's 40 riders on the gate, but there's 41 riders. The 41st being the track conditions because it is a constantly changing. It's a, it's essentially, it's a dynamic situation. So it always changes. And I find, especially with doing motorsports, photography and videography, it's very, you don't get second chances. So for example, one of my good mates, Dylan Wood, um, he likes to get the bike a bit sideways, which is absolutely unreal behind a camera. Um, but sometimes he doesn't throw them as as wide as what he would the lap before or something like that. So it's a very, you know, one-shot opportunity um, genre, which I the chat like that challenge of you know making sure i capture that shot is i think that's what i really enjoy just that challenge and you know having to work with tricky conditions especially on some of the longer days so for example the nationals yeah um, which i have been doing quite a bit um so the first round was at one thaggy in victoria and we were shooting into the morning light which for like from the landscape days I was hating it, but that golden light that was showering the track, some people were able to capitalize on it and some people weren't. And I was one of them that was uh, fortunate enough to be able to capitalize on that morning light, which some of the shots that I got from that day, hands down, are some of, if not the best shots I've ever taken across both um, both genres. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so having to... Sorry. Sorry. Do you think that uh, having that landscape experience has has enhanced and helped your uh, motorsport? Oh, definitely, without a doubt. Um, So, how how do you think the two have influenced one another? I think um, one thing to take away from landscape is having to always constantly change settings and Mm -hmm. stuff like that. So you work with your environment. Um, So as you can. Well, as you would know quite uh, quite well, some sunsets that we get, the lighting is very harsh and you yep. have to adjust and, you know, do a blend and stuff like that. But um, having that sort of pre-existing knowledge of, you know, how to how to compose shots, uh, the, you know, the general rule of one-thirds, that sort of stuff, um, as well as being able to adjust settings um, to be able to work with the light um, that has definitely helped out massively. And I think had I not done landscape, it probably would have been a more tricky transition into motorsports. But um, don't get me wrong, I still love doing landscape photography, but at this current point in time, my main goal is to, to continue um, building on the motorsport side of things and also you know, going out there and having fun. Um, sure. I think that's one other big factor as well is a lot of the boys that I do take photos of, um, I used to race with myself. So it's yeah. a bit of a camaraderie. Yeah. We're always having a laugh and it's just a nice environment to be in and not to mention the race fuel and some of the bigger events, that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. So I guess in terms of your, your, your landscape stuff that came after uh, when you started photographing um, your, your your motorsports, I take it. And so, how do you think the the motorsports uh, photography sort of influenced getting into the landscape side of things? That's actually a bit of a tricky one. Um, I wouldn't say that the motorsports um, from when I was back racing, I wouldn't say that really had a heavily uh, heavy influence on um, okay. giving landscape a crack. It was actually from uh, my drone. So I kind of went the the opposite way to a lot of people. I got a drone and then I got a camera, whereas a lot of people get a camera and then a drone. So I, yeah, I was always captivated with flight and, you know, having, I can still remember so vividly the first time I took my drone up to Cathanil Bay, it was just watching it through a screen and just being able to fly around and just, see things from a different perspective that was what got me hooked and i think that was what was the biggest driving factor behind giving landscape a um a crack was just having a unique perspective and being able to look at things and see things differently to what others would and you know i still like even when i'm driving to work so like i just got a new job up in the mines in singleton so i get to drive up there 
yep. an hour every day, which is great fun. But um, I find myself, especially, you know, when I'm starting the sun starting to rise, like I just find myself looking out the window and, you know, you see trees and windmills sure. and all that sort of stuff. And it, a lot of people would just see a tree or a windmill, but I see so you're something that, up comps, yeah. yes, yes. <laughs> so I don't think that will ever go away. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like it's as much as I love landscape, it's just at this current point in time, like where I am based out of, it's just, there's nothing that's really got a, um, there's nothing that really sort of motivates me enough to be able to, to go out and chase that sort of, or chase the shot. So like most yeah. of the shots that I've gotten on the coast, um, I've, yeah, I've been happy with, and there's nothing that I would change. And again, touching on that sort of creative um, mindset, I can't, if I'm not having fun and challenging myself, I know that, the products that I will produce are not going to be what I'm capable of. Sure. Whereas if I challenge myself and I'm having fun with it, I always look back at, you know, shoots and just go like, how did I manage this? Yeah. And it's just because, you know, I challenge myself and having fun with it. So I guess one, one of the key things from the sounds of it is that, you know, you like that opportunistic type of shooting that, you know, yes. the stuff that comes along, you know, might might be once in a day, might be once in a, a, a lifetime as well, you know. Yes. Uh, and you know, you're not you're not necessarily going to be able to get that shot unless you're there and uh, you know in, in the space at the right time. Yeah, a lot of um, so like I love astrophotography, and uh, one of the things that was on my bucket list, which I actually got to um, tick off, funnily enough, through a bit of a work venture. Um, I wanted to go to outback, New, well, outback Australia, um, sure. away from light pollution, you know, just in the middle of nowhere. Yep, some real just, dark skies, yep. Oh, yeah. And the first time, so I was actually doing a hot shot, so an urgent freight delivery with one of my good friends from Singleton to uh, Lake Vermont Coal Mine, so in Dysart, Queensland. Yep. Um, so we, we drove from Singleton right through to Dysart and outside of Roma, um, in Queensland, we had to do a swap over just with the um, national heavy vehicle laws. And so as we're doing a swap over, I jumped out and I had my camera with me and the sky, I will never forget that night. It was absolutely spectacular to just look up and just see the Milky Way so clear and so visible. Yeah, amazing. I wish I had more time to shoot up there, but um, unfortunately the 13-ton wheel assembly we had on couldn't wait. So... Yeah, that got the extra shots got put on the back burner. But I mean, I know what it's like out there now, and it's only sort of motivated me more to to get out there and actually have fun out there and just chase some of the wildest astro shots um, that yeah. I can imagine. Yeah, no, I, I definitely got to agree with you. Getting out into those real dark sky areas is uh, phenomenal, um, and you know, city people that. Uh, have never sort of left the city, and I know that there are some people that do that. You know, it's amazing oh, yeah. when you get them out uh, into those spaces and and show them what the sky actually really looks like, as opposed to what it looks like with a load of light pollution in it. And yeah, uh, you know, people just get blown away that there's so many stars. Yeah, I yeah, like I'm fortunate enough to to have grown up sort of where I have. So sort of halfway between Sydney and Newcastle. So we do get some dark skies, but nowhere near as dark as what um, what we had up in Queensland. And like there's been times where it's been, you know, clear night, really cold, just the perfect conditions for Astro. And you look up and it's like, oh, yeah, this looks really nice. You know, there's heaps of stars. And then when you go out with them, same conditions to so somewhere that has no light pollution whatsoever, it's just, it's mind boggling just to see how many stars and, you know, yeah, yeah. how it, for me, I find, or well, I found that night just really reflected on how big the universe actually is. And yeah. I find it, it sounds, it's going to sound a little bit strange, but I kind of find it a bit humbling in the aspect of there's so much going on out there that we are, insignificant in comparison to what to how big the universe actually is and totally. like i said it does sound a bit strange but 
no, I find not, it very not humbling. Me, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad. Yeah, not to me. I, I I had that same sort of feeling. You you look up there and you sort of go, okay, well then there's there's probably somewhere on on a uh, planet circle and one of those uh, stars that's looking up and they're they're seeing us or Think our sun, the same maybe, thing. you know, if, yep. if they're lucky, close enough. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, it is an incredible experience. There is one thing that I would love to do, and it's high up on the bucket list. And unfortunately, with this new job, I won't be able to do it for a minimum of about 12 months. Yeah. Um, I want to go to Iceland and see the Northern Lights. Um, uh, yeah. good. I, I, I did uh, Northern Lights in Canada uh, a couple of years ago. Well, 2019 yep. was December 2019, just before everything went to shit. And, uh, uh, great fun. Yeah, but uh, we, we were up there for three nights. First night was uh, solid cloud. Second night was, uh, well, it's actually first night, there was a couple of breaks in the cloud, but a really weak aurora. You could yep. just see a tiny bit of green that lasted 10 minutes. And so it, it was, you know, not really able to be photographed well yep. you know you didn't have time to get set up and get everything lined up and get a good comp and everything you know yep. um and then the second night was pretty much solid uh cloud again um the third day we it was snowing all day and you know just sopped in and we thought you know it's just going to be a washout and i thought i'd you know done my dough going up there yep and uh anyway it turned out uh, about oh, just before midnight, it cleared up, and then about one in the morning, I think it was, um, it just lit up, and uh, yeah, it was absolutely phenomenal. And came away with you know, some I mean, it was my first time, so I don't think I, I, I know I could do it better, um, yep. but you know, came away, came away with some great memories and some you know, fairly memorable shots out of it, which was, was nice, but um. Yeah, for me, it, it, that that was definitely a highlight. Getting up there into uh, into the Arctic, you know. Yep. Bloody freezing though, middle of winter, <laughs> minus thirty five. Um, but uh, you know, loads of fun. Yeah, I um, my parents are have been to Canada and Alaska and have seen it themselves, and very similar situation actually. Um, you know, total cloud cover, not even like. If you were to look at it on a like the odds of it, it was pretty mel zero. Like it was not going to happen. Yeah. And then same thing. Woke up about one a.m. and yeah, walked outside and sure enough, there she was. So, and um, yeah, some of the photos that I've seen, like my dad, he did have a camera with him, but he didn't really know how to do it yeah, or yeah. how to do the sort of long expose that sort of stuff. Um, some of the photos that he got, like they were really nice, but. Yeah, it was one of them things where it's like I wish I was there with yeah better gear and also that knowledge as well um, yeah. of what to do. And yeah. I like I've always wanted to go to Iceland um, and Norway just for the Northern Lights. And then when uh, J Rod from Victoria he went over, and I was following his story, like his adventure pretty closely. And yeah, that was um, that was mind boggling just to see. You know how how incredible Iceland is, especially for a landscape photographer. Like, there's so many, so many unique things over there that we don't get in Australia that you can shoot and yeah, things like that. That's that would that's the sort of stuff that I love. Like that creative sort of again touching on that creative aspect. Like, it's something that I've never done before, and it's something that you know drives me to want to do it. Um, I was planning on doing a road trip to America in 2020. Um, but yeah, we kind of all know what happened that year. And uh, <laughs> I wish that I did get to do it because I was going to be going to Yosemite National Park, um, which I have been to before as a teenager with my parents. And there, I can still remember there's one section of the park uh, we come through a tunnel and it comes basically right up to a valley and that valley just looking straight down into it almost it's very similar to the blue mountains but it it just left me speechless and i was like i really want to come back here and you know visit it in winter which i think now 
they've changed it around a little bit so that the park actually stays shut in the winter, which is a bit unfortunate. But I mean, I'd probably be that uh, that one person that's either dumb enough or brave enough to give it a crack. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. So I guess just talking about that motivation, I mean, you've talked a lot about uh, the way that you motivated by those unique experiences i guess you know how how do you approach your photography you know I, either the motorsport or, or landscape stuff um in terms of looking at it from a, an artistic perspective versus uh you know capturing just the experience of being there so you know are you trying to create something that's as realistic as possible or are you trying to you know, stretch the genre a little bit and uh, move into something that's a little bit more artistic? Um, it's a bit of bit of both. Um, so some, there have been some times where I've gone somewhere and I've seen something I like and it's like, you know what, I would really love to do, say, a composite or something like that. Um, with the motorsports, I generally find that or I generally find myself walking the track if it's a track that I haven't been to before um, just to get a bit of an idea of how how to expect things to shape up um, so you know some corners for example like if they rip it really deep so they break the soil up it, they'll get some nice deep ruts and you can get the bikes laying um, so the riders laying the bikes over in the ruts and stuff like that um, so yeah with the motorsports I generally try to walk the track um, if it's a new track that I haven't been to, um, to just get a bit of an idea of what to expect and, you know, um, certain spots that I think will look nice. Um, so most of the tracks that I normally shoot, so for example, Lakes, which is at Toronto, which funnily enough, my parents used to own. Um, and then there, we've got Maitland, which I was at two weeks ago for the Nationals, and then Cessnock. And yep. I, I do go in and now a bit as well. But them tracks, like I've been to them for, you know, so many years like i don't have to i know what works and where i want to be sometimes again if the conditions aren't that ideal so for example lakes we generally every time i go there we generally have a lot of overcast cloud cover so it's not really that ideal but um you know i'll change it up and try to try to work with the clouds and some of the jumps that look basically up into the sky like try to get a bit of a dramatic sort of a look to it but um yeah, with the with the landscape, I generally try to make it as realistic as possible. Um, I some people aren't a big fan of vibrant colours, where I love my vibrant colours. So, sure. fortunately enough, like the system I use, so I use a Canon EOS R at the moment. Uh, fortunately enough, the Canon colour technology is it's unbeatable, um, and just some of the colours that you're able to capture with the with the Canon color tech is just phenomenal. And the contrast between the colors as well is just, it's unreal. Um, I generally don't do too much post uh, processing to the colors um, unless it's, you know, say if, if it's an average sort of burn or an average, uh, sorry, average sunrise or an average sunset, I might bump it up a little bit, but for yep. the most part, the, the Canon color tech just takes over and yeah, it always delivers the goods. So um yeah, so I generally try to go for as realistic as possible. Um, some situations I will try um, sort of tap into that artistic side of things, but for the most part, I generally go for a realistic look to it. Yeah, okay. How would you um, say your style has developed over time? Is it still developing or are you sort of settled on on what you like doing? Um. So I think it's a bit naive to say that, you know, your style is like you've set with your style. Like I, th I find it's a constant sort of game of, you know, trying like trial and error. Um, so, you know, cameras are getting better and better every day. And, you know, my EOS R versus the EOS R5 that I had a couple of weeks ago, like I can tell you right now, like if I was shooting landscape with the EOS R5, I would have to change so many things around just to, you know, to be able to accommodate and maximise uh, what that camera is capable of. So I, I generally have my my foundations, if you will. So I gen have a bit of a you know idea of what I want, that sort of thing. So I generally don't trend, uh, I don't track too far away from my foundations. But yeah, you know, I always like to try and 
try different things and you know again just trial and error see what you know try some settings if it doesn't work or i'll revert to what i'm used to or sure yeah you know, uh, again like i always like to sort of um constantly learn and constantly develop on my skill set and i think you know the second that you stop learning is when you i I look at it that way, you know, when you stop learning, you st- that's when you start having your downfalls. Yeah, um, totally. <laughs> so, yeah, like I always sort of, again, have my foundation, but I, I'll, I'm, you know, open to exploring different techniques and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, cool. How do you balance your full-time work and your photography? Obviously, working in the mines, they uh, give you a, a fair amount of stuff to do. So how do, how do you sort of balance that time? Well, fortunately enough, I am working at um, a mine that I think it's the only mine in, I could be wrong, it's the only mine in possibly New South Wales that does eight-hour shifts. Oh, wow. Um, so, okay. yeah, I'm very, very lucky there. So it's a Monday through to Friday roster. And I, this, so I've, one of my old firefighting captains, he was an OCE um, so open card examiner for one of the mines in the Hunter Valley. Right. And he, he, you know, growing up, he always taught me that, you know, work is priority. Like as much as I love doing photography and, you know, getting out there and shooting sunrise and sunsets and that work always comes first because, you know, it pays the bills. So yeah. that's generally how I look at it. Um, don't get me wrong. Like I always check the forecast and, you know, if there's a nice high cloud sunset that's coming in, I always try to get out and uh, chase it. But, yeah, if it's too, like if I have to be up early or whatever, um, if, or if it's going to affect work, I should probably say, if it's going to affect work, like I'll always sort of choose work over over photography. Yeah, and that's only, yeah, that's only because, yeah, work pays the bills. So, um, and the job that I got, I'm very fortunate to have been chosen for the role. So I don't want to, don't want to do anything that's going to jeopardize that role. Yeah, no, fair enough. In terms of the way that you shoot, do you think that's been influenced by where you live, particularly on the landscape side of things? One hundred percent. I used to live at Guanolin. I've currently moved just because of work. Yep. So I used to live at Guanolin. So Caffinil Bay, you know, the coast, ten minutes away. So I always found myself on the coastline. So seascape was one of the one of the first um, sort of subcategories, if you will, that I picked up on. Sure. And yeah, if you scroll back through my feed, you'll see that there's a lot of Scott, a lot of um, seascape shots, and I've got a lot of seascape shots that I haven't posted. But um, I'm just trying to keep the feed in check to make it look a little bit more professional for some of the the bigger brands in yeah. motorsports that have been doing work for. So, um, but yeah, yeah, I find myself on the coast most of the times just because you know it's ten minutes away to a lot of the a lot of the best spots in the area. Yeah. Um, I also love going up to the mountains as well, but yeah, with the rain that we've had for the past six months, the roads have been terrible up there. So I haven't really been going um, up into the mountains. Um, yeah. But in saying that, the rain that we have been getting has made the waterfalls pretty pretty awesome. So I um, not too fond on shooting Summersby just because yeah, it's, it's fairly it's very overexposed. In, in yes, part. yes. Um, so I I generally try to find the little uh, lesser known ones. So I generally find myself going to uh, Giracle and just going, you know, going for a trek and seeing what I can yeah. find. Yeah. Um, well, as well as part about that area though, is that there's, there's quite a lot of options, you know? Oh but, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, it's really hard to, to, to get something that's um, new and interesting at Summersby itself. Um, yeah. But you know, I, I, I did see an interesting one actually, uh, I think it was Danny Watson posted, which was a, a pano, uh, which sort of went from up the lower falls. So you, it was looking up towards the, the lower falls and then yep. panned down around and looked basically 180 degrees around down where the... Yeah, the right. Was, you know, which was something a bit different. Yeah. Uh, I might actually have to have a look at that because, um, yeah, I'm actually quite intrigued by that. Yeah. I... Um, I think one of the best waterfalls I've ever been to was uh, Gap Creek in the Wadigans. Um, yeah. I don't recommend doing the hike down to the bottom of the falls, especially with 20 kilo camera gear, because that was horrible. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, it's the but, one, one bad thing about waterfall photography is the uh, the hiking in and out of the valleys. Oh yeah, sometimes it's not too bad. Yeah, some um, some are better than others, definitely. <laughs> it's it's actually quite funny that I mentioned Gat Creek because um, I was actually up in the mountains for a sunset and uh, could see some low cloud on the horizon. So that pretty well uh, diminished any you know, chances of it burning. And later on, I, I was right on that uh, that prediction. So I was, I was seen from one of my good friends that I used to go to school with um, a video of Gap Creek and it looked, it was pumping. It was torrential. Um, and I was like, you know, I don't want to go check that out. And the road to get to the camp, but the, the campground was shut. So I couldn't, couldn't do that. And I was like, oh, I might walk down. And then when I found out it was about 400 meter elevation difference, I was like, mm, yeah, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. So <laughs> I don't want to get, don't want to get me mountain goat on this time. So I um, sent her a, a message and just asked, you know, what, basically what to look for. And she said that there was a big sandstone sort of amphi- amphitheater um, looking feature. And I was up at a lookout and I was like, I could see something in the distance and it looked very similar to what she was describing. So yeah. I have my drone with me and um, sent it over there. And yeah, that was absolutely, yeah, spectacular. Like I think, I think I was one of the first people to ever actually see that, that waterfall flowing um, with a drone and, you know, a fairly substantial amount of water flowing over it as well. And that cast, like there's multiple cascades and I've got a, um, a couple of different photos and I actually done a panorama of one and it's in terms of uh, drone photography, it's probably the best photo I've ever taken. And I honestly don't think I'll be able to, to top that one. Um, I would like to check out Ellenborough Falls, but um, yeah, just trying to find the time to get up there and also timing it with the conditions. Um, yeah, I want it to look as mean and as menacing as what it does. So, or as yeah, what is it? It's, it's, it's a beauty when it's pumping. It's, oh yeah. Uh, I mean, it's still, it, it, even, uh, I, I remember being up there, uh, when we were still in drought conditions and there was still yep. a fair amount of water off it. Not, not masses, but you know, um, I, I reckon, uh, this, uh, th- this year it, it, it'd just be absolutely massive. Yeah, the other, the other uh, thing I've I've chased a couple um, of waterfalls that don't exist when it's dry, so they basically only exist when it's peeing down with rain. Yep, I know of one um, near where I live. So, I it's funny that you mentioned going up that way in drought because um, during the 2019 2020 bushfires, I was actually deployed to a bees. Oh, it was a fire called the Bees Nest Fire, which was at Dorigo. Yeah. Um, and we got sent down to Igor. Why? I have no idea. I don't even think they knew what they were doing at that stage. But um, we, yes, yeah, so I went down to Igor and checked out Igor Fours. And that that was a bit of an eye-opener, that one. Like, I've seen so many photos of Igor Fours, you know, throughout the years. And every photo I've seen or video, it's always had, you know, a fairly substantial amount of water flowing yeah. over it. Yeah. And um, this time, like, it was a trickle. And that was a massive sort of eye opener just to how bad the conditions were up there but yeah you know, as you as you mentioned like with this year with how much rain we've gotten and also how much rain is forecast for the next couple of months um ebor is one that i want to check out again and actually see it you know live up to its height essentially yeah. but um yeah even like you know ebor and even waterfall way um yeah yeah when the road is actually there and not washed away <laughs> Yeah, that 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 is the problem with some of these places is uh, getting access into it. I mean, even up the Blue Mountains, they had uh, the landslips there at uh, Lura Cascades. So you couldn't yep. get them, you know. And that, I mean, that that's got to be one of the easiest and most accessible uh, waterfall walks in in the country, I'd say. Yeah, um, you know, it, it was just completely inaccessible because the uh, the, the the landslips that they'd had. It's just. You know, it's crazy to think like when landslips and stuff like that happen, it's just crazy to, to you know, see how what, what water does and how powerful it actually is. Mm-hmm. Um, so like with the, with the floods that happened only recently, like I 
just made it out of Singleton by the skin of my teeth. Like that was pretty scary, that one. Yeah. But just the sheer volume and sheer power that was, you know, that water possesses. Like I, th- I find that's one thing about waterfalls and seascape, just the sheer power of it all. And as you know, with seascape, like it can get hairy pretty quickly if you're not paying attention. Yeah. Um, it's been multiple times where I've been soaked and uh, quite frankly put myself in some pretty dumb situations. But, I mean, as long as I get a shot, I'm happy. <laughs> yeah, it's not worth dying for though, mate. <laughs> no, definitely not. Yeah, when I mean, when you talk about the power of water, I was, I was down at the Nepean River down here uh, just north of Penrith Yep. Uh, last weekend and um, there's... A, a, an area there which is sort of just beyond the Victoria Bridge, uh, probably, I don't know, five, six hundred metres up from there uh, on the western bank um, where the land gets a bit flattened out and yep. there must be at least, you know, two, three hundred trees just, and I'm not talking about small saplings, I'm talking about, you know, trees that have been there for you know, 50, 60, 100 years, you know, they, they're just flattened. They're just lying yeah. down because the, the water's just pushed them over. It's it's crazy, eh? Like, yeah. um, so when, just to give you an idea of how bad it was in the Hunter Valley, um, so Wollombi Brook, like I've never seen water that bad. And, yeah, I've got a lot of mates that work up in the mines and, you know, for toll and stuff like that, and they go around everywhere up there. And just the sh- like how quickly the water came and just the sheer volume of it, like that was like nothing I've ever seen before. And um, when I just before I got evacuated of Sing- evacuated out of Singleton, um, I popped up to the levee and just had a quick look and just seen you know how bad things were getting. And about two hours later, the water had risen by at least a meter and a half in that two hour time frame, and it's just. It's yeah, like it. You like what took one and a half meters doesn't sound like a lot, but when it's already you know twelve meters and flooding, yeah, you know, lower lying areas of the Hunter, like the Hunter River, it's yep. just it's it's mind boggling. Um, yeah, totally. And yeah, you know, even now, like driving over the bridge, um, so I got to drive over the Hunter Hunter River every day to go to work, yeah. and you just look down to the river and just. Same thing, like some trees that were there before just clean snapped in half. Like it's, yeah. it's yeah, it's phenomenal. <laughs> so what what what's your favourite uh, shooting spot? Not to give any secret ones away, but you know, where, <laughs> where do you like to go? Or what do you keep going back to? I find myself going back to Castle Hill Bay. Um, yeah. It is oh, fairly a, overexposed. It's a classic, but yeah, yeah. I. It's a bit of a special area for me, um, just more so for personal and family reasons. Sure. Um, so it's an area that, yeah, I always find myself going back to. And it's not, there's not really a lot of compositions there that I want to chase anymore because I pretty well shot all of them. Um, but I just find myself going back there more so on a spiritual sort of, it sounds pretty dumb, but more of a spiritual level. Like I just find, I feel like it's, yeah, you know, I've, Catherine Hill Bay to me resembles home. Yeah. Um, right. So, yeah, when I've been overseas and stuff like that, I've always found myself coming home and then going straight to Cathal Neal Bay and just kicking back on the beach, you know, for a couple of hours. And it just, yeah, I don't know. It's on a spiritual level, that one for me. But, yeah, Cathal Neal Bay. And there's also a couple of hidden spots in the Marmora State Conservation Area, which I uh, want to keep to myself. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fair enough. I, I don't blame you. <laughs> that, that's fine. So what's the most memorable experience you've had now? taking shots where do i start um do you want some bad experiences or some oh, good ones? whatever you want bit, bit of both. <laughs> bit bad and different <laughs> all right so probably the worst one i've had um middle winter during a cold snap so i went to the uh bogey hole yeah the bogey hole sorry i just had to think of um what it was called so I went to the bogey hole with Lee Taylor and a couple of other like a um, couple of other guys from up in Newcastle, and we were chasing some pretty monster swell up there. And watching the sets come through, like I generally sit there for a good five minutes, five ten minutes, and just watch and just get a bit of a beat on what's going on. Anyway, so I was watching watching these sets come through. And I'm like, oh yeah, it's fine. Anyway, so just brought a um, 
brand new Tamron 2470 F28 and I was playing around with that. So I went down to the boat hole and set up for a composition that I thought would look pretty cool. Big wave come through and I was looking, I was like, oh yeah, that'll be fine. And then it's come through, washed well, straight across the, the, the boat hole, so the bath there, hit the back of the cave and just exploded all over me. Like I was drenched. And that was probably the worst experience I've ever had, mainly for the fact that I just had a two and a half thousand dollar lens just get absolutely soaked in salt water. And it was during a cold snap as well. So I was soaked and I had no warm clothes and yeah, it was not fun. Definitely not fun. That one. Um, so you're definitely a seascaper then because, uh, Oh yeah. As I say, if you're not wet, you're not seascaping. That's exactly right. Um, I would say in some of the situations I'm at almost Matt Finn level. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I've generally found Seascape is probably the one that I've always had sort of bad experiences with. Um, another one was up at uh, Anna Bay, again, like shooting with Lee and a couple other boys from up there. Yeah. Um, so some of the rocks up there, it's very similar to the Bay of Fires in Tasmania. Like it's got a bit of a mossy cover into it. Sure. sure. I had a terrible night's sleep and I was, yeah, just wasn't in a good mood. Drove up and I was like, oh yeah. Sunrise was all right. So I was walking around, just sort of sussing out and just seeing what I'd like. I didn't know about the rocks at the time being covered in a moss that was extremely slippery. <laughs> and I I think I went ass overhead probably about five times. And by the end of it, I was just tempted to throw my bag in the water and just walk away. I was like, no, nah, I'm done. I'm <laughs> over this. <laughs> and um, I think Lee probably remembers that one pretty well as well, which... Yeah, he can uh, verify how funny it was when I slipped over. So. Yeah, uh, got to got to got to love the slippery rock. I um, oh, it's great fun. I went down to Terrical. Uh, oh, it's probably about six months ago now, uh, January, February time, and um, did a did a dawn shoot up there, which you know came away with some nice shots. But um, yep. before I got down there, uh, I stepped on this black patch, which I dip, I couldn't see. I, uh, I had, yeah, my, yep. had my headlamp on, just couldn't see that this patch was black and it's that, you know, that black slippery shit that, you know, yep. and landed on the backside and anyway, dusted myself off and went and took photos. Anyway, my wife was sitting up in the car with a, a, a cup of coffee, um, you know, while I was doing the, the first set of shots and she came down and she came up to me and she, I, I said to her, how are you going? And then she said, oh, not too good. I fell over. And she's <laughs> oh, exactly the no. same patch. <laughs> but she, she had the benefit of some daylight. I didn't, I didn't see this. <laughs> see, in that sort of situation, that's when it's like, you know what, I've kind yeah. of redeemed myself because I wasn't the only one that done it. Yeah, that's it. I feel yeah. better about it. But, um, yeah, I, have, I think I've only had one bad experience at Terrigal, and that was um, up on the Skilly, and I was – um, oh, yeah. unofficially looking for whales off the coast as you know you're not allowed to but anyway i was doing it and the lightning tower or the lightning rod that they got up the top there um oh, yeah. oh, sorry not the lightning rod the weather station yep that interfered with the drones uh magnetics oh okay yeah. oh that was horrible brand new mavic mavic 2 pro launched it compass has just gone haywire everything's gone haywire it's flying off out to sea and i can't control it i was I thought for sure it was done then, but um, somehow I got it back. Somehow, still haven't quite figured out how I managed to get it back. But um, yeah, I got it back, so I was pretty happy about that one. But yeah, after that, I was almost permanently scarred of uh, Terrigal Skillion. <laughs> after, yeah, I was uh, <laughs> pretty pretty worried about that one. This this was down in the gap between the Skillion and the the headland. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. You know that, that was where where I slipped ice overhead. Yep. Uh, anyway, so what uh, what what's your routine when you you know getting out to to shoot and you know what what are you looking for what are you what are you thinking about when you're uh, setting up for a shot? Um, to be completely honest, I I kind of go out with a clean slate. I have a bit of a general idea of what I want, but I don't really um, chase you know, finite details. I don't really look for that sort of stuff. I go out, bit of a clean slate, just sort of 
have a bit of an idea. I, like I want to do seascape. All right, I'll find something that I like. And yeah, a lot of the times, yeah, like the beaches are constantly changing, especially yeah, you know, some of the some of the ones around Newcastle lately, like with the swells that we've been having. So yeah, um, oh, it's, that's the same all up and down the coast. I was down at a beach the other day that's normally got you know a hundred meters of sand between the the seawall and the the water, and the, yep. the water's lapping at the seawall. Yeah, I you know things like that where it's a bit of a unique sort of you know possibly a once in a lifetime sort of thing. Yep. I will yeah I will go chase things like that. Um, but for the most part, I generally yeah approach it with a bit of an open mind as to what you know go there, see what I can you know see what I can see. If I find something that I like, I'll shoot it. And yeah, if it's some if it's a composition that I really like, or yeah, for example, um, some of the some of the places I've been to, uh, you know, shooting seascape, like there's been uh, certain rock formations where, you know, the sun can peek through and you get nice little sun flares, things like that. If I know that I can get that, I'll be, yeah, I'll stick with it. Sure. Um, but generally I, I tend to wander a little bit. Um, so if I go out shooting, say I'll choose a general location. So I'll just say Catherine Hill Bay, for example. Um, yeah. I, I always sort of trace the, the comp like the common composites uh not composites composition sorry um yeah. but then i generally yeah once i've got one or two shots all right sweet i'll go chase something else i'll go try find something different something new yeah. or yeah something i haven't done for a very long time um so yeah i generally try to again i generally try to approach it with a bit of an open mind as to what um yeah what essentially what's on on offer um so you, you're spending much time planning a shoot beforehand or do you just sort of look at the forecast and go? To be honest, most of the times I just wing it. <laughs> That's fine. It's, um, some, some people are right into intricate planning and they're, they're working out, oh, yeah, well, if I get there at this this time of year and the, this 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 weekend uh, I've got the, the moon rise over this building and all those sorts of things. I'm, I'm not one of those either. I'm, I'm more of a wing it guy. Yeah, I again, it depends on what I want. So um, yeah. some shots, you know, for moon, for example, moonrise. Like there's one that I've wanted to do at Nora Head, but um, every time it's we've had a full moon, uh, sorry, a new moon at Nora Head, it's always not really worked out, whether it be you know clouds or whatever. But um, like things like that, I will you know sit there and pre-plan. Um, most of the sunrise and the sunsets, again, like I'll sort of jump on and have a look at the forecast just for the you know, high clouds or that sort of stuff. Um, ideally, I like chase inversion layers just because it hangs around for a lot longer. Absolutely. But, um, yeah, um, again, it just depends on what I'm doing. So um, at the moment, with you know, I start at 6.30 in the morning up in, the, up in Singleton, so... I don't really have that opportunity to be able to shoot sunrise at the moment. So I don't even bother looking at what the forecast will be like for sunrise because I can guarantee I'll be behind either the wheel of a dump truck or a loader or something like that. But um, don't get me wrong, it is pretty nice in some of the pits, but um, oh, yeah. especially when you're backed up under an 800 ton excavator. Um, but Have yeah. Have you done any I, photography around the mine or is that just not? It's like, um, can't do it. It's a very grey area. I would love to do it. Um, one of the boys in tech services, he's got a Phantom 4 and he actually films all the blasting. Yeah. And I said to him, I was like, I want to bring up a Mavic 3 with the um, 120 frames and actually do a super slow-mo of a blast. He's like, yeah, let me know. I'll bring it up and we'll go for it. I was like, hell yeah, let's do it. But um, Hasn't happened. <laughs> yeah. Well, I got to, got to watch one go off um, on Friday. That was right. bloody unreal. I'll, I'll stay outside. It was unreal. Yeah. Um, just to watch. It wasn't a big throw one. So this was a through seam. So it's a um, little little bit on. Most of the ones that they do up in the valley are big throw ones. Uh, yeah. But you can do through seam ones. But we generally try to avoid it because um, we can actually ignite the coal seam on fire. Which is that. not good. Oh, no. It's not fun. Um, so this one, yeah, it was a through seam. And just to watch... The material just it was almost like a wave just watch it rise and fall and then you feel the vibrations and the boom and yeah that was um pretty awesome to watch not gonna lie 
Um, but yeah, I would love to get the drone up and actually do some um, some film or to film a blast and also just do some general filming, which I mean, down the track, I might even, um, you know, see if we can do a bit of a training sort of video, that sort of thing. But um, one thing I would very much love to do, especially at my site, is photograph some of the uh, rehabilitation work that's been going on. Yeah. Um, there was one section that we've done that's been rehabilitated. And honestly, if you if you put on a blindfold and walked into it and just took the blindfold off, you wouldn't even know you were on a, what was an old coal mine. Um, so I would love to do a little bit of sort of, you know, photography and that sort of stuff. And also I want to get a photo of our big 9,800 excavator because that thing is just a beast. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, unfortunately that's probably going to be a couple months away. Um, just until I get to know everyone up there a little bit better and, you know, they get to know me a bit better. So are there any, uh, particular, you know, photographers or tutorials that you've sort of followed that you, you learn from? I mean, how did you, how did you sort of pick up your photography? You start, you said you started with drones and whatever, um, yep. are you self-taught or do you go and do some courses or you just sort of picked it up as you're going along? Um, a lot of it is self-taught. Again, this just touches back to that, um, trial and error. Um, so, you know, trying things and seeing if it works. If it doesn't work, change it up and, you know, learn from your mistakes. Um, that's how I, I approach photography is, you know, you learn from your mistakes. If you, you know, overexpose something, all right, well, you can change it next time, that sort of thing. But a um, couple of my big sort of influences, um, one of my good mates, Denny Mole Media, he earlier on in – the days like he was one of the big sort of one of my big sort of uh i wouldn't say influences but you know he sort of showcased what a drone is actually capable of doing and you know i've been fortunate enough to come uh become good friends with him and yeah we've been able to go out and shoot and stuff like that together and just a lot of he's got so much knowledge about drones it's just it's yeah it's unbelievable so um he's one of the bigger well, sort of bigger influences and um, sort of inspired me to, to pick up my drone photography. Um, but yeah, I've, like I, I follow a lot of people. Um, yeah, J Rod is another big one. I find his style is just, it's unique. It's, he always, just every post he has is just an absolute grand breaker. Like it's, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I know for a fact, like there's always going to be, you know, you go out on a shoot and stuff like that, you get that one grand breaker and then you get, 10 other you know, crappy photos. He probably won't now post them, but he always just seems to have banger after banger. And it's just, yeah, that's um, another big sort of inspiration. Like just, you know, that quality. Um, and yeah, I, I firmly believe that it's, it's a game of quality over quantity. Um, yeah. It's, be- it's all well and good to take, you know, a hundred photos, but if you can get that one shot or if you can get that one photo in, you know, five shots for example yep. like that's yeah that's how i sort of look at it but um um for the for the video and the motorsport side of things um tom noski is one of my big influences um yep. just he also like he does more so filming than uh stills but same thing like a lot of the the techniques and a lot of the you know color grading that sort of stuff um you can take across into to stills and photography as well. So um, he's one of my main influences for um, color grading, that sort of stuff. But yeah, apart from that, there's not really, not really anyone else in Australia that sort of, you know, provides a massive influence to myself. There are Mm -hmm. a couple of people overseas. Like for example, there's one guy in San Francisco, uh, Cody Meyer. And some of the shots that I've seen from him, like, you know, the fog in San Francisco, it's just unbelievable. Um, yeah, but again, like that, a lot of that is locale. Um, yeah, we don't really have heavy fog like what they get in San Francisco and things like that. Um, but yeah, there's, yeah, there's a couple of people that I do take a big shine to, um, to sort of improve on my own photography and, you know, again, just, try to be better and try to improve on things and try to learn new things. So, 
Yeah, fair enough. What about your uh, processing uh, workflow? What does that look like? And uh, again, not looking for um, you know any secret source elements or anything, but you know, in general, what are you are you you know straight off the uh, off the camera onto the computer and um, edit as quick as you can, or do you let things gestate for a while and you know um, think about it before you get into it? Generally, I try to just get straight into it. Um, there's been, you know, sometimes where like I haven't been able to because of a work commitment or something like that. But yeah. for the most part, I generally try to get straight onto it. Um, I don't really have, to be honest, my workflow is probably my biggest downfall. Yeah. Um, I've got a got a workflow in place for motorsports, like you know, for the nationals, for example, when I'm taking photos, you know, 10, 15 riders, like I've got a bit of a workflow there, which has definitely made things a lot easier on that, like that side of thing, um, or that side of photography. But for landscape, I don't really have that much of a workflow, which is yeah, it's not some like I know it's something that I can improve on, but I just haven't really found anything that sort of works for me, if that makes sense. I don't have presets. I'll straight up say I don't have presets. I find that with some presets, like some work, but most of the time they don't, for me at least. Um, so I would much, I would go through and edit photos. So for example, if I go to a sunrise shoot where, yeah, there's a lot of magenta or something like that, um, yeah. I'll go through and edit to, you know, if I'm, sometimes I can find, I find magenta can be a little bit overpowering. So I might change that color around a little bit. So it's a bit more of an orange instead of a magenta, um, yeah. things like that. I generally go through and edit a photo and then if I like how that looks, I'll copy and paste that sort of them settings to the next lot. But I always go through and generally tweak little bits and bobs. Um, but yeah, it's something that I, I definitely need to um, improve on. Yeah. And yeah, I'm pretty big on self-criticism and, you know, um, being able to sort of look at how I do things, like take a bit of a step back and just see how things are going and like, you know what, this is, an area that I can improve on or, yeah, this is an area that I don't need to improve on. Like I can focus um, on improving in other areas. So yeah, um, workflow is definitely one of them. Yeah, okay. So what about, uh, I mean, how, how long would you spend on a, on a shot before you, you're happy with it or does that really depend? Some, I mean, obviously if you nail something in camera, you know, which for me is rare, um, you know, it, it shouldn't take too long. But how how long are you normally sort of spending on a uh, on a composition or a on a shot? Um, it, you pretty well said it. Like it, it depends. Um, yeah, it just depends. So, for example, there's been a couple of shots that I've been to where I've had to do a lot of spot removal. So, um, spot removal you know, as it takes a lot of time. So things like that do take a little bit longer. I think the longest I've spent um, on one shot is about two hours, but it was worth it. Um, I'm very OCD with details when it yep. comes to, again, like this is just, you know, I like to produce the best quality that I can. Like I'd much rather put, you know, one post out a month, but it'd be my best work versus, you know, 100, po uh, 100 posts in a month. Um, so, yeah, 100 is a little bit too much, but you get the idea. Yeah, I get it. Um, yeah, so it just depends really. Um, there's been a couple of shots, for, for example, um, one of my good friends um, down at Wonthaggy for the motocross and I'll show you um, I'll show you a photo of it a little bit later. It's um, Blake Fox on – so he's in the MX2 class, which they do first practice, so the first bike's out on track. And what they normally do, they normally do a practice start and then they'll do a sight lap and then come back in. Uh, sorry, no, they've changed it around. Sorry, that used to be the old way. So what they'll do, they'll do a practice start. All the bikes will take off and then they'll all come back in and line back up again and then do another practice start and then start doing their practice and qualifying. Yeah. And I got a photo of him um, just with that. The dirt down at Wonthaggy was a very sort of, it was a very um, good mix of river sand, like your nice alluvial rivers, um, nice alluvial soils. And you river sand. It was just unbelievable to take photos of. Like it was so just the contrast between the colors of the bikes and the gear and stuff like that and this dark, nice, loamy soil. Yeah. Um, and in this particular shot, 
you've just got that nice golden light coming in from yeah you're golden now and then you've got just the vibrant colors of the bike and his gear and it's just i took that photo was pretty well straight off camera and i was i was in love with it it was just absolutely phenomenal um but yeah there's been other shots that have taken a lot more editing um so just trying to think of a recent one so um so for example the one that i took um out in the outback of queensland um the astro shot i spent a lot more time on that one just to because i didn't have a lot of time i wasn't able to shoot a longer exposure to so drop the iso down massively and i can expose the truck and the um the foreground more appropriately um so i had to unfortunately i had to just run at a high iso which um as you know when you put it into post it does pop up pretty grainy in certain areas you get a lot of noise and that sort of stuff so i spent a lot more time on that just trying to drown out as much noise as possible without you know making it too obvious so that took a lot longer to do but yeah it just depends on you know what i get so yeah cool what do you see as being the biggest challenge facing photographers at the moment i I think so there's a couple of there's a couple of things to be completely honest. Yeah, we are losing a lot of a lot of nature uh sort of nature based spots um just through development and that sort of stuff. So mm. I know personally, for example, like Catherine Hill Bay, I'll touch on that again. Like they've just built a massive housing estate there and yeah, you know, before you used to be able to sort of like it was an old coal mine, so it wasn't natural as such, but it looked a hell of a lot better than what it does with, you know, 150 houses there. So, I know um, yes, I think that is one big challenge for photographers at the moment, especially for landscape, you know, just with the development that's going on, like you can't stop development as much as you, you know, you wish and plead. It's not like, it's always going to happen. So, um, you know, things like that is pretty hard as well as, you know, certain areas of national parks and stuff like that being locked up and, you know, certain famous spots being locked up just because, you know, for example, Helensburg um, Glowworm Tunnel, like, yeah. you know, I've, I've seen a video of someone going there doing a steel wool spin. Like, when I've seen that, I just thought to myself, like, how dumb can you be? Yeah. But, you know, how selfish and how dumb can you be? Like, they're glowworms that are sen- they're sensitive to light and you go there and throw melt, um, molten chunks of, you know, steel wool at them. Like, yeah. And then as a result, the whole, you know, whole tunnel got locked off. So right, yeah. um, I do find that it's as much like, you know, it's, it's kind of funny because social media is our biggest, you know, it's our biggest platform. Yeah. You, we do have, there are some people out there that I know of that stay away from the whole social media and, you know, just do like word of mouth and farmers markets, that sort of stuff, which don't get me wrong. I think that's bloody brilliant, but yeah, if you, if I would you love make to, it work for you financially, it's great. yeah, I would love to give it a crack, but yeah, I just don't have the time with, yeah, with work and other commitments, but um, I find social media is probably our biggest downfall as well, because like wedding cake rock, this is a classic one. Like it, it's a beautiful spot and mm-hmm. yeah, under certain circuit, like certain conditions, just that white rock and just the leading lines in it is they're phenomenal. But now it's all that whole area is all closed off because it's become so popular on social media that every man, yeah, you know, every man and their dog, Tom, Dick, and Harry go there. And as a result, it's fractured even more. And now it's actually in danger of collapsing into the sea and being lost forever. Yeah. Um, so I think social media is definitely our biggest downfall, as well as I think one other big thing as well is. I haven't seen too much of it lately, but, um, you know, there are a couple of people and I'm not going to mention names because yeah, it's not, yeah, not yeah, really no, a good not. place to do it. Um, there's, you know, a couple of people, like I can remember there was an argument in, um, or not so much as an argument, there, there was a big sort of blow up in on social media about, um, two guys in Sydney. Yep. Yeah. You know, like I think, you know, that to be completely honest, I think a lot of it has to do with jealousy. Oh, um, yeah. yeah, like don't get me wrong. I, so, for example, like, say, Danny, he's down at Bermagui this weekend. Like, I would have loved to have gone down there, but, you know, work is more of a priority to me at this current point in time. Yeah, um, you know, I've seen a photo of him putting up, uh, sorry, a photo that he put up from Bermagui, and I was like, God damn, that's so sick. Like, I'm actually jealous I'm not there. But 
yeah, then I thought about it. I was like, that's like some when someone gets, you know, some people when start, they see someone else get a shot that they really want, they do become quite bitter. Yeah. And I think, you know, social media is bad for that, um, especially nowadays. Like it, it wasn't too bad a couple of years ago, but I find it has gotten worse over the years with just more so um, like a lot of brands are, as you know, now starting to sort of push more so on the social media side of things. So, um, yeah, I think I think that a bit of a rivalry sort of, that might be in a more appropriate word. Um, the rivalries that have sort of kicked off has um, definitely been a challenge. And I, like I've, I've had my own personal rivalries as well. You know, I'm not proud to admit that. And, you know, it has costs in some yeah, you know, some aspects it has cost friendships and stuff like that. But yeah, you know, like it sucks. But yeah, you know, I've tried to let th- you know let things go, and I think taking that step back and you know just being able to appreciate what other people create, mm. um, and you know being happy for them. I think that's probably the best mentality to have. You know, support one another. Like you know, yeah, for example, I'm, I may see a shot that I don't like. Like I could be you know very picky about like oh i don't like this composition or whatever but you know i don't i think it's pretty rude to to comment on things like that you know if you've got nothing nice to say don't say anything at all and yeah, i've a had mine a bit different if someone's asking for critique oh definitely uh, if somebody's put it put something out there and said critique this tell me what's wrong with it you know yeah i'm more than happy to accept some feedback if oh it's 100 you know, if, if I'm if I'm just putting my work out there, and you know, somebody comes along and says, "Oh, well, you know, you've screwed this up," and it's like, mm, "Yeah, so what?" It's a I bit of a slap in the face, yeah. Yeah, I, d- I didn't ask you to comment, you know. And yeah, that's right. I'm, like I'm not likely to go and comment on somebody else's work in in that way either, you know, unless unless yeah. I've been invited to. And if I've been invited to, I'd do it in a in a way where the feedback's constructive, you know. Yeah. I, I almost always term it if, if if I was doing it, here's what I would do, as opposed to that's wrong, you know. Yeah, one hundred percent. Like I, um, I don't know if you remember. I kind of remember how long ago it was now. Um, I posted a composite that I'd done um, down overlooking Sydney because I think that was the period when we were having some pretty wild storms down there. Yeah. Um, so I posted a composite which I thought was pretty fitting, and like. I, when I do my composites, I try to make them look as realistic as possible. So, you know, balancing the lighting and all that sort of stuff. But this one, like I didn't really put too much em- uh, emphasis on trying to make it look realistic. I was more so going for that sort of end of days look. And sure. like it blew up and it went, you know, I had a lot of people like saying, you know, I love the art, like, the creativity and, you know, 90% of people were pretty stoked, you know, like that they never, and, you know, some of them were like, oh, damn, why didn't I think of this before? And then you get that 10% that's, oh, this is shit. You know, this is terrible, that sort of stuff. It's like, I I sort of look at that. And I'm like, I don't really care because it was more so, it was something that I wanted to create. Like, yeah, right. I was, yeah. but if say, for example, you know, as you said, like if I ask for cre- like criticism, if someone's like, oh, this is just shit. Well, it's like, it's a big slack in the face. Like, well, you know, I'm asking for criticism. That's not really criticism. That's just downright being... Yeah, yeah being nasty. That's it. So, but, um, yeah, no, I, I, I do think that, you know, some of it's just jealousy, as you said, you know, some particularly yeah. if, you know, a, a shot blows up and gets a gets a lot of attention, you know, people people sometimes get a bit jealous of that. Um, oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, you know, uh, I mean, I've, I've been fairly lucky. Not much of my stuff has blown up, you know. <laughs> with, yeah, with, I can uh, relate now. <laughs> I'm I'm totally fine about that because you know I, I I'm I'm enjoying what I'm doing and I'm putting out the work that I enjoy making you know and and say so, like um, ultimately that's that's the most important thing like if you're having right. fun then that like if you're having fun doing it then who cares you know like obviously a lot of people you know blame stuff on the Instagram algorithm which to some degree is right because you know I've had some for example I've had a reel that I posted you know six weeks ago. Yeah. Overnight, got like a hundred likes on it. I'm like, how how does this work? Like, it's six yeah. weeks old. Um, yeah. So yeah, to some degree, like it, the Instagram algorithm does have a lot to do with it. But ultimately, like, if I'm having, say, for example, like I, when I go out shooting with the boys, so um, if I go to one of my mates' properties or we go to a 
you know, a private riding school. So um, one of my good friends, he's got his own track and he does his own coaching um, out Buchanan. Yep. And like I, I go out there and, you know, I'm having fun there. So even if I, like if the lighting's terrible, if I'm not getting, you know, not getting my shots, that sort of stuff, if I'm out there having fun with the boys, having a laugh, like ultimately I'm happy to post things like that because, you know, I'm enjoying what I'm doing. And I think, I think that's one big thing to take away from. And I think that's one thing that I think a lot of people should sort of try to get into the the mindset of like, you know, a lot of people like, oh, delete. I've seen people, for example, delete photos because it hasn't been, yeah, it hasn't got over X amount of likes in X amount of time. It's like, but why? Like, did you have fun shooting and creating it? Yes. And why should you, ca- you know, why should you care about your likes? Yeah. I mean, I- at the end of the I've I've never never understood the I mean I I get if you're a professional brand that you know curating your um uh you know your your feed or curating your page is probably worth doing to a certain extent but should you be doing it because of the number of likes it's got or should you be doing it because it's a good and you know it's, it's a very subjective thing. Or, or oh, one hundred percent. And for me, if it's a good image, it stays there regardless. Of yeah, one hundred percent. Likes or twenty thousand. You know, I don't care. <clears throat> yeah, I went through um, just after. So, like my Instagram handle before was just fifty, and my race number two four zero. And I, I stuck with that for years. And then when I started doing more so professional side of things, like so, you know, doing paid shoots and that. I that handle wasn't appropriate. So I went through and I got rid of a lot of photos that I didn't like. A lot of them, you know, some of them had, you know, 500 plus likes. But if I wasn't, like what I was aiming for was something that showed my best work. So for example, this was one of the baddest, or oh, sorry, one of my worst traits, which I thankfully kicked. Um, I, I did get sucked into that quantity over quality. Um, yeah, and it's funny that I mentioned it earlier that I'm big on it now because I was sucked into that loophole and yeah, I went through and I deleted. So I think I think I deleted about a hundred posts because looking back on it, I was like, it's not my best quality work. And this was just, you know, in that time frame where it's like, I've got to post X amount of posts every two, you know, every two days, every, well, that sort of thing. And um, like, there was a lot of pressure there to, to go shoot. And I found that I wasn't having fun doing it. Um, I wasn't enjoying myself and I wasn't enjoying the products that I was creating. So, yeah, yeah. and then, you know, I had a bit of a, the only way I can describe it is a bit of a midlife crisis uh, with my photography. <laughs> and one of my good mates, he asked me if I was going out to uh, Maitland for the Pro MX, so the yeah. Nationals, and that's where it all started. Like, um, it was funny because I had a couple of riders. So some of the top tier riders in Australia see some of my po- like some on my posts and some of the photos that I was getting. And they're like, how long have you been doing this for? And, you know, I said to them that Maitland, so Maitland Prime X last year, so um, two weeks ago, or well, one year, two weeks ago, was the first time I'd ever actually shot in motorsports on a professional camera. Yep. And all of them were just gobsmacked at how good it, like the quality of it. Yeah. You know, um, and I, like, I, like, same thing I was going through, like, I can only describe it as a midlife crisis. It sounds so dumb, but um, yeah, I went through that sort of, that was when I was kicking that sort of uh, quantity over quality. And that's when I really started putting more emphasis on just chasing them the best quality and, you know, making sure that what I do put out is the best of the best. And, you know, I may not get the likes that I'm doing because, oh, sorry, I may not get the likes that I was getting before because I'm not posting as much. So my sort of, my post gets shown sort of lower in the feed, but ultimately I couldn't care I couldn't give two shits about the like because I'm happy to produce, like that I produce that that content. And yeah, a lot of the brands that I've been doing work for. So for example, like I've been shooting for Fox and you know Yamaha and stuff like that and KDM Newcastle. Um, KDM Newcastle was one of the big ones that sort of helped me get into it, um, working with these bigger brands. Um, you know, like they're they're loving the products I'm producing and it's just because I've sort of changed that that mindset of, yeah, I've got to post, got to post, got to post. No, I want to be able to post the best quality shots when I can. Yeah, totally. 
I absolutely one hundred percent behind that. That's uh, the the only way to be. Yeah, oh, definitely. Po- post the stuff that you're proud of, and uh, yeah, you know, just get on with it. Yeah. That said, you know, um, if you if you are looking to grow your following and all that sort of thing, it's very difficult to do that unless you're yep. a regular poster. So you know, that's yep. that's that's the trade off, and that's I guess the the dichotomy that you have with um, you know uh, social media. Yeah, like there's one guy um, in the motorsport side of the motorsports community, um, Mick Williams, so post moto. Yep. Like he doesn't, there's some other people in motorsports that have got big, you know, big following, but their, the quality of their work to me personally is very average. Yeah. But then there's guys like, for ex- we all call him Posty. So guys like Posty, for example, his work, like if you've seen some of the quality of his work, like, you know, some people may not necessarily understand what I'm talking about because it's motorsport, but Yep. the quality of work that he produces is hands down. It's probably the best in Australia. Yeah. And, you know, like, again, I, like I become good friends with him. Um, you know, just doing the circuits and stuff like that. And like, he, you know, it's, he even agreed, like there's other people out there that got bigger followings, but if you're not producing the best quality content, then what's it matter if you, you know, if you've got, say 20,000 followers, but you're only getting X, you know, X amount of percentage of people, like your followers actually seeing you and liking the quality of content that you're producing. Whereas if you've got say 3,000 followers, but you're getting, you know, let's say, I know it would never happen, but let's say you got all, every one of them followers loved the work that you were doing. They're going to stay with you and they're going to, you know, I find that does help with the, the following as well. Like I've had a lot of people um, sort of showcase my work to some of their mates and I've, they've become, you know, um, sort of your long-term loyal followers, but absolutely, like, yeah. I'd much prefer to have a smaller, smaller account, and again, post the best quality content that I can, rather than have say t- again twenty thousand followers. But yeah, you know, I mean that mindset of qual- uh, quantity over quality. Mm, totally. So, are there any other photographers out there you think I uh, should be talking to on the podcast? <laughs> Where do I start? I think we should do. I think you should do your own little lip, um, your own little episode. <laughs> uh, I've I've done my intro. That's that's about all I want to say. <laughs> Mind you, I was on somebody else's podcast the other day, so I'll uh, I'll, I'll I'll tip you when that comes out in a couple of weeks, and uh, you can you can have a listen. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Um, there actually is one person. Um, I didn't mention him before, but Ollie Hubs. Um, yeah, yep. He, I, I'm going to start saying, he's got something that a lot of people don't have and it is absolutely unreal to see him see him do do his thing. Yeah. He, he's, he reminds me very much of J-Rod. Just every, like, yeah, what he shoots just maximises the best out of it and just always produces insanely good, um, product. Yeah. I think I think it'd be pretty interesting to get him on the show and um, sort of see how he does things. I don't know if he'll be willing to share his secrets, which uh, kind oh, of, I'm not, I'm not kind of sucks. But <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm I'm just interested in what makes people tick and and why they do what they do. And so I'd I'd be very interested to uh, to talk to Ollie. Yeah, yeah, I think he would. Um, he'd definitely be one to sort of. Um, interview and yeah, let's see what his uh his thoughts are and see what sort of drives him and what motivates him to to do what he does. Yep. Because um yeah, he's definitely one of them ones where yeah, he, he just yeah, it's the quality that he gets is just phenomenal. Yeah, he there's knows, no other way to describe to, it. Knows how to nail an image. Oh yeah. yeah. I'm actually kind of jealous of uh, how. <laughs> how he's uh, able to just clean up every time. Like every time he shoots, he always cleans up and it's just, yeah. it's a good kind of jealousy, but like, it's just, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool just to watch, you know, him just clean up every time. So totally, <laughs> I reckon get Denny on. I know he hosts, he hosts his uh, Drones Down Under podcast, but I reckon get him on. Yeah, get him sure. on. <laughs> and, um, 
I think he would be able to share a pretty unique landscape perspective. Um, well, landscape drone photography perspective. So, yeah. um, you know, especially like he does a lot of civil and um, industrial work with the drones as well. So it'd be pretty interesting. I reckon he'd um, be a good person to get on just to sort of sort of dive into, you know, what he what he looks for and yeah why he loves doing landscape with the drones and stuff like that and what sort of drives him to do it absolutely sounds good sounds good but, uh, yeah apart from that yeah there's not really anyone else that i can think of off, off the top of my head at the moment yeah no worries thanks for that i've got one more question and uh it's the most important one i think uh anyone can can ask in life do you yep. like pineapple on pizza <laughs> I'm 50-50 on this. Um, I'm very – I find sometimes if you have too much pineapple, it's too overpowering. But if you don't have enough pineapple, it kind of ruins it. So, yeah, yeah I'm um, I'm 50-50 on that one, but I would have to say yes. Okay. So you're all wine, yeah? Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> deep pan, though, deep pan. Yeah. I'll tell, I'll tell you what, it's, it's pretty much evenly split on the people I've spoken to so far. It's uh, – there's, there's not much in it. But yeah. those that don't like it definitely don't like it. That's, uh... <laughs> I think uh, I think they just don't know what's what's good for them. I don't know what they're missing. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. All right, it's been absolutely brilliant. Uh, no worries. Thanks for having us on. Ab- absolute pleasure. It's uh, it, it's been fantastic uh, spending some more time with you. Uh, and we'll have to organise a shoot at some point. I think. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm I'm always keen. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll uh, I'll get in touch with you and we see what we can work out. Where can people find your work? So I post mainly on just social media. So Instagram. So my Instagram handle is Fitzy Images. Um, I also do post on Facebook, but I am more active on Instagram, um, just because that's where a lot of sort of a lot more of my. Uh, following is if you will sure no problem oh thanks again mate no worries thanks for having us thanks again for listening to landscape photography world i hope you enjoyed the show and keep listening because i'll be joined by some great guests in upcoming episodes you can find my work in this podcast at gruntswinburnphotography.com i'm also on instagram twitter youtube and facebook don't forget to enter the landscape photography world awards This competition is open to all photographers worldwide and will feature some amazing prizes and your work could be included in the book and calendar which is planned for creation at the end of the competition. Early bird entries are open until the end of September 2022. I'm Grant Swinburne. Hope to see you out shooting soon.